and Will Smith will face Will Smith, veteran left-hander, the 25-year-old catcher for Remember That Guy, the show where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players. Jordan and Gretzky, Serena and Ruth, remembering great ones is easy to do. What if the names who spent their whole lives Lost them in footballs and catching sack flies Their guys, remember that guy Remember that guy, remember that guy Remember that guy, remember that guy They're just gonna remember some guys now Past and present. Hey there, folks. I'm one of your hosts, James. Let's get jiggy with it. Let's get jiggy with another great episode of this pod. Diaz, glad to be back with you once again. And we have a very special guest. It's not Will Smith the batter. It's not Will Smith the hitter. It's not Will Smith the slapper. But it is a pretty cool guy. Yeah, I'm Will Smith the game designer, the one that did uh crap. Was it The Sims or was That's it? Uh, cool, right. No, That's there's there's, right. a, there's another Will Smith in video gaming. I know because I've listened to him on podcasts before. So I was just and that's who you are. Smiths. Yes, I'm, I'm the other Will Smith. I don't remember which Will Smith it is that we're talking about, but Xavier, it's you that we want to welcome on, and it is you who has memories that I want to know uh, the maker of. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on right now. I guess I'll start with the weekly Women's World Cup roundup. It's wild. Three of the top 10 teams in the world, including the number two, did not make it out of the group stages. Germany got knocked out of the group stage for the first time ever after a 1-1 draw with South Korea this morning, while Morocco beat Colombia, who had already been through, essentially, in a 1-0 game at the same time. And it was crazy because, again, Germany, number two in the world, expected to win or get very close, had never not made to the knockout stage, and they're knocked out. Brazil, one of the most storied teams in the world, also ranked number eight, gets knocked out by James. The reggae girls. I'm forever just going to coast on making vibes-based picks in soccer and somehow turning out correct. I need to learn absolutely nothing more about soccer is what I'm being told. You know what? I think that uh, that's a good plan, but... It's been a really good World Cup. A lot of upsets, a lot of shocks. Number seven, Canada, also out. It, it's been really interesting. I'm excited to see the, what happens in the knockout stage because the bracket has shaped up. It's very strange. There's one like word of the bracket that I feel like any of the teams can win. That is might be like an easier bracket. There's Switzerland, Spain, Netherlands, South Africa. None of those teams really super impressed me too much. Meanwhile, there's also a quarter that's Japan, Norway, Sweden, the United States. Japan, the team that's probably looked either the best or second best this tournament. Norway, which has some of the best players in the world. Sweden, which always does really well in tournaments. And the U.S., who has been poor by their own standards, but has the individual talent to turn it on at some point. And then on the other side, I think England is by far the best team left on the entire other half of the bracket but they could possibly have Colombia in the quarterfinals and then a France or Australia semifinal. Either of those would be difficult games. A lot of teams, I think, could still win, and I'm really excited to see what happens. I think my money might be on Japan right now. The only worry with Japan is that they have not had to come from behind yet, and I'm not sure how well their style would work if they were having to press to find an equalizer. But we'll see what happens. It's been really good. There's also a lot of other things that have been happening, though. I do want to give a quick shout-out to Katie Ledecky. The 2023 World Championships were in Japan last week, and she did pass Michael Phelps for most overall individual golds with 16 and 21 golds overall. That's right. The record has been handed off from the North Baltimore Aquatic Center to the North Baltimore Aquatic Center. Baltimore produces some... Freakish swimming athletes. No, we produced the two greatest swimmers of all time. Get that shit straight. <laughs> it's, I, I think it's just a testament to Old Bay, specifically being a performance-enhancing seasoning. I, I think that's what we have going on. It's not a banned substance yet. So my, my favorite thing about this is that Kayla Decky has now won six golds 
at the 800 meter freestyle at the Worlds, which is the most times anyone has ever won any individual event. And it's been the last six times in a row. So the last time someone not named Katie Ledecky won the 800 meters was 2011, when I was in high school and Katie Ledecky was in high school and had not started competing professionally yet. Since then, she's had it unlocked to the point where she holds the 28 fastest times of the 800 meter in history. So the leaderboard is 28 Katie Ledeckys, and then the first time you get someone else is 29. It's like when you look at the list of the highest scoring games in NBA history, and then it's like, well, would you look at that? Will Chamberlain, Kobe. Will Chamberlain, Will Chamberlain, Will Chamberlain, Will Chamberlain, Will Chamberlain, Will Chamberlain. Except if it was only Wilt, and then you get down to like 40, and it's like, okay, there's Kobe. But there is other stuff going on, and so I want to be quick about these next two. One, Jerem Ursay is a freak. If I die tonight and Jonathan Taylor's out of the league, no one's going to miss us. So I'm going to spend $20 million to fly this orca whale cross-country to release them in the pod off San Francisco Bay. Because that is what I want to spend my money on and not keeping the best player on my team happy in, uh, in any way. The state of Maryland should have eminent domained that fucking franchise away from that family. I mean, which is the more upsetting possibility? Because like Jim Ursay, like was a recovering addict who like has allegedly gotten sober. So one of two things is possible. Either he's relapsed or he is just actually this wild in real life. One of those two things is true. Man, you've seen his dad. I'm still leaning towards the latter. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he's just unhinged. Yeah, I think he's just unhinged. But, you know, when you're that wealthy and you're used to no one ever saying no to you, I think you can just become that unhinged even without alcohol. What else is unhinged is the Yankees ownership and just the Yankees in general. Because in the past 24 hours, we've had the news that Domingo Herman is on the restricted list for the rest of the year because he is an alcoholic. Bringing up many possible memes that he was drunk while throwing a perfect game, but also bad things because, remember, he is also a domestic abuser and an alcoholic. This is not good. He's probably never going to pitch for the Yankees again, which is a good thing, but also a worry about, like, when you're an alcoholic, you do dangerous and unhinged things that hurt those around you. And I hope that rehab helps him, but it does not look good, especially the fact that, hey, they said, oh, he has an armpit issue, so we're not going to start him. And then he came on in relief and pitched five scoreless innings in that same game, which means he probably was just drunk and they waited for him to sober up before pitching. Well, no, he had an armpit issue. The issue was that he was trying to hide a bottle of whiskey in his armpit so he couldn't raise it to pitch. Or, I, I mean, they were trying to, like, sweep it under the rug and then, like, well, shit, we forgot the rest of our pitching staff sucks too much to get away with that. And then at the same time, Anthony Rizzo, who had been our best hitter through the first two months of the season and then got hit in the head by Fernando Tatis and has statistically been the worst hitter in the two months since then, hey, guess what? Turns out he has a concussion that they've linked to that, which every single Yankee fan in the world could have told you. He looked like he was concussed while like trying to play baseball. Turns out he told the Yankee staff that he was suffering from brain fogginess during the Orioles series, especially after the game where he went 0 for 5 with five strikeouts. And they put him out to start the next two games anyway before finally putting him on the I.L., where they say he he has cognitive impairment. It's a it should be a fireable offense for everybody in their management to have like, hey, this guy clearly looks like he got hurt when he got hit in the head. Let's just play him for two months anyway and not ever follow up on it. I mean, look, it took them a while, but at least when they did finally acknowledge it, it's still more descriptive than like the NHL upper body, lower body injury thing. So I think you can give them a little bit of credit there, but. Two months of an undiagnosed concussion is about one month and 30 days too long. And there's also like been reports coming out today that Brian Cashman had made deals to sell off a bunch of players, because, like, you know, try to pivot toward next season. And Hal Steinbrenner refused to sign off on any of them and just blocked the Yankees from doing anything until 
letting them just get a middle reliever at the deadline. So, yeah, everything's going great in Yankee land. But even the Yankees are doing better than the Pac-12 because we're back in realignment, purgatory. Shit is going off. No one knows what's going on. There are reports coming out every fucking hour about new stuff. Oh, the Pac-12 is going to explode. Uh, but the Big Ten doesn't want to be the one to do the death now, even though they were the ones that took UCLA and USC, making this all possible. But now they want to... They, they like did the death guys. nail. That's yeah. the, they did it already. They can't not want to do it. It's like the guys who shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Look, we didn't want anyone to start a war. So the options that have been bandied about just in the past couple hours from all types of sources are one, Arizona goes to the Big 12 and that kills the Pac-12. And from that point on, the other four corner schools, Utah and Arizona State, go with them. And then the Big 12 has 20 schools at this point. Then the Big 10 takes Oregon and Washington and possibly Cal and Stanford because of academics, but no one's sure. And that would leave Oregon State and Washington State on their own and probably having to just join the Mountain West, which would be awful for them, but you know they wouldn't really have any other options. Another one I saw was the ACC saying, hey, maybe we add an eight-team Western wing and try to get the rest of the Pac-12 to to join and just have a coast-coast conference. And then the third option I saw was that the nine revenue-generating schools in the ACC have a majority uh, of the vote and could dissolve the ACC as a conference to avoid having to deal with the grant of rights issue and create their own conference where they make more money than everyone else, and your Wake Forests and Boston Colleges and Pitt all get stuck in the back and just have to like have their own lesser crap conference. It's a giant mess right now, and by the time people listen to this, there could be like three conferences left in major college football. No one knows. Anytime this is brought up, all I go back to is... All of this started because Villanova wouldn't let Temple join the Big East. That's literally what started all of this. And I don't think enough people appreciate or know that. Burn Villanova to the ground, you're saying? They serve no purpose, as they are not a Philadelphia school. <laughs> hey, maybe we can come all the way back around. <laughs> maybe we can get into the bad ACC. The teams that would be in the bad ACC are Boston College, Georgia Tech, Pittsburgh, Syracuse, Wake. So those are the those are the bad oh, ACC. Maryland. Okay, teams. sick. I was waiting to hear Maryland. <laughs> well, Maryland's. Oh yeah, shit. They're not. A, yeah, fucking. I hate all this shit. Yeah. So that's the bad ACC. Weirdly enough, like they had, they don't have Duke in like the Big Nine. I assume they would be a part of this new only good ACC. But hey, we can play Pitt and Syracuse. That'd be fun. Well, man, I'm not going to lie. That all kind of sucks. Diaz, do you have anything to brighten the mood? (laughs) Well, I I need to issue a retraction. Um, Oh? When our most recent episode dropped, I claimed in that episode that Naya Inoue was now, without a doubt, the best pound-for-pound boxer in the world. And I made the mistake of saying that before Bud Crawford fought on Saturday. Bud Crawford, undefeated, was going against Errol Spence Jr., also undefeated, both kind of consensus ranked as top five pound for pound fighters. Crawford was kind of like three ish. Spence was like five. So it was like, okay, if somebody comes out and has a decisive victory in this fight, I guess that would put them to number one. But this was expected to be a very competitive fight back and forth throughout. Um, And it just simply wasn't. Bud Crawford got a knockdown in the second round. It was clear from the opening bell just as it was in that Inouye Fulton fight. It was clear from the opening bell that there was a clear class difference here. One fighter was clearly better than the other. Crawford got another knockdown in the ninth round, and Spence, to his credit, made the count both times, but was just very clearly taking too much punishment. Thankfully, the ref stopped in in the ninth round. Spence protested, but this was an example of good refereeing in boxing. Got to protect the fighter from himself sometimes. And... I mean, it was just an evisceration. Because as impressive as it was what Inoue did, Fulton, if you were to go down, is probably around like 20 
in pound for pound, very, very good, but not an elite talent like we thought Errol Spence was. And maybe Errol Spence still is, and that's just how good Bud Crawford is. But it was a dominant victory, and for the the second time in two weeks, I need to proclaim there is a new pound for pound king, and there aren't any big boxing matches other than Jake Paul. If Jake Paul can beat Nate Diaz this upcoming weekend, that already happened by the time you're listening to this, then maybe Jake Paul could get up there. <laughs> but unless he really does something impressive. Bud Crawford, the new pound for pound goat in boxing. I shouldn't say goat. Goat is all time. The current, right now, best boxer in the world. And I mean, there's still some good fights to be made for him out there. Gravante Davis is now trying to, you know, say, oh, I would I would knock him out. Bud Crawford's a little better than Ryan Garcia. Gravanta. I just want to say that. I know he's your boy from Baltimore, James, but I mean, he's Baltimore born, bit. but also like, don't worry, my loyalties for any fighting from here do not run particularly deep. We don't need to get into Gravante Davis's personal life. That's totally fair. Floyd Mayweather is one of his idols, and we'll just yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> but Bud Crawford has never been found to have done anything shady like that. All he's done is beat people up very consensually and legally with gloves on in a boxing ring. He does it very well. He does it better than anybody in the world. And I hope he continues to make great memories in the ring. Yeah, we're not here to kink shame boxers. They can, they can do whatever they want in the ring. Well, but we don't want them to do whatever they want in the ring. They can do whatever they want within the rules of the sport in the ring. Legally. Uh, we do mean anything within the rules of the sport, if you catch what I'm saying. Well, what I want to catch, James, is a couple of memories that are being made for you. That's perfect, yes, because it actually involves a sort of catch. Uh, have you guys seen the Slade Ciccone strikeout yet? No. I have not. Okay, so there's a guy named Slade Ciccone. He was drafted by Arizona. Uh, this is the 33rd pick in the 2020 draft. He's been in the minors, totally like normal minors progression. He's been in AAA Reno Aces all year this season. And in 20 starts, he's 4-8, 638 ERA, 103 innings pitched, and just a hair over nine strikeouts per nine innings during that time. But we're getting to that time where like, hey, man, every once in a while, you just need some innings. And so Slate Ciccone was called up August 2nd, 2023 by the Arizona Diamondbacks. He makes his debut in San Francisco against the Giants. And the first batter he faces in the bottom of the first is Orioles legend Lamont Wade. Full count. And Lamont Wade takes what at first is called to be a hit by pitch. Uh, But it is one that is immediately challenged by the manager of the Arizona Diamondbacks because uh, it's a hit by pitch that for one seems to actually hurt the catcher Jose Herrera just a little bit more than the batter because however it ricochets it ends up hitting him quite sensitively with that ricochet so they go to review it and umpire Gabriel Morales comes out and he informs us that the call has been overturned after review the ball the pitch ball hit the bat Went into the catcher's glove. The call is overturned. It's a foul ball. It's strike three. There's one thing I want to fixate there for a moment, Mr. Morales, and that is that you said the catcher's glove. Now, with the rules of baseball, since it came off the knob of the bat and then landed squarely in a position where it was pinned against the knob of Jose Herrera, it was considered a caught ball, and thus this was now a swinging third strike caught by the catcher, giving Slate Ciccone his first career strikeout in his first career plate appearance against Lamont Wade Jr. And Yope finished with a totally fine line for his debut. Four and two-thirds innings, four hits, one walk, two earned runs, two strikeouts. Only one more after this for the rest of the game in the no decision. D-backs eventually lose 4-2. Dan Patrick talked about this, and he pointed out one thing that I do think is interesting because you know Slade Ciccone is still going to hold on to that ball forever. Like, that is a treasured artifact to him. That's his first career strikeout. And it was very lovingly cradled by the cradle of Jose Herrera. And I was just tickled by the whole thing. Jose doesn't seem like he was tickled at all. It seems like... He was in very good spirits about it later, is what I will say. I mean, having been in that position, because, like, I was a catcher when I played, and, like, I was an umpire, and, like, sometimes you get hit there... And a lot of the times, it's just like the instinctual reaction is to think that this is devastating pain, too. Like, hopefully that's what happened there, where just your natural inclination is to think you're dying. And then about 30 seconds later, you realize, like, 
Nope, actually hit my like my real groin, not like my quote unquote groin. It hit my actual groin. Well, and all the more reason for the Arizona manager to immediately like issue the challenge, give the catcher some time to recover as they go to the video booth and have to figure it out one way or the other. But anyway, Slade Zaccone, he's making memories for me right now. However, as we let off with you, Xavier, here for what was making us memories, we got to lead off with you for the category that you brought up this week. And I, I think it'll take us back to a little bit more of our turn of the millennium craziness there at the beginning of the episode. Uh, yeah, so I thought it'd be interesting to talk about guys who aren't the first person you would think of when you said their name. And, you know, they could be very accomplished themselves, but someone else just happens to share their name and be more famous. So when I say the name Billy Bean, I'm sure you and our listeners are thinking about Moneyball, Brad Pitt, the death of the Oakland A's, R.I.P., uh, while, yes, that's what a normal person would say, when you announced this category and said you were selecting baseball, I did right here next to the name of my guy, my guess for what Xavier would do, which is Billy Bean. So please continue as I luxuriate. Congratulations. This. Congratulations. Big hand for guessing that. But as James accurately predicted, the Billy Bean that I want to talk about is not the former A's GM and analytics pioneer, but this Billy Bean was a pioneer in a different way. William Darrow, Billy Bean was born on May 11th, 1964 in Santa Ana, California. Uh, Billy's parents separated when he was six months old, and he was raised by his mother, Linda, and his stepfather, Ed Kovach. He attended Santa Ana High School and was the MVP on the baseball team that won a state championship in 1982. Uh, he decided to stay close to home for college, so he attended Loyola Marymount University, which is less than an hour away. Quickly excels on their baseball team as well, and after a junior season where he hit 403 and was an honorable mention All-American, he gets selected by the New York Yankees in the 24th round of the 1985 draft. But Billy Bean had promised a return for his senior year, and he turns down a $55,000 signing bonus. During his senior season, Bean leads the Lions to the West Regional of the NCAA Tournament. They lose in their first game 11-5 to UC Santa Barbara, but then they beat UCLA, beat UC Santa Barbara in a rematch, and then beat Hawaii twice in a row to make it to the College World Series. Their first and only appearance in the College World Series. In their first game, they beat LSU 4-3. They do then fall to eventual champions Arizona 7-5, and then get eliminated by Oklahoma State. But still, this day, this is the greatest ever season in Loyola Marymount baseball history. In 65 games, Billy Bean hit 355 with eight homers, 68 RBIs, 505 on base percentage, OPS of 1.114, and was named second team All American. He gets drafted again, this time in the fourth round by the Tigers. But they do only give him a signing bonus of 12,500 because at this point, they know he has nowhere else to go because he's a senior coming out in the draft and not a junior. You know, what an excellent you, reward for your wonderful college performance, kid. So would you trade a $40,000 in 1980s money for a College World Series appearance? Maybe, if it's the only one in your school's history. But, like, that is a significant chunk of change that he did miss out on by going back to school. Billy immediately gets assigned to the AA Glen Falls Tigers in the Eastern League, which is... Close to home for me, it's about 45 minutes from where I grew up, up in Hudson Valley, New York. And he immediately becomes one of the best players on the team. He hits 276 with an OPS of 783. Both were good for second on the team. But at this point, he starts getting mistaken for other people. After one game in Connecticut, a spectator came up to him and said, You know, I've been following your career for years, and I still can't believe the Mets traded you. Because this guy was thinking about the other Billy Bean. And our Billy tried to explain that he's not the same guy and quote, he couldn't believe I was the same guy and, and just didn't accept it. And now to clarify, I believe he does not spell it with the silent E at the end, correct? No, there is no silent E at the end. This is Billy go. Bean, B-E-A-N. Like a black bean or a pinto bean or a kidney bean. No extra E. Regardless, didn't take long for the Tigers to call him up to the big leagues. And on April 25th, 1987, less than a year after he'd been drafted, Billy Bean makes his debut against James's hated Royals. 
And he proceeds to have a four-hit game, becoming only the 10th rookie in MLB history to have at least four hits in their first game as the Tigers crush the Royals 13-2. to Also, the Royals back then are fine. There's a very specific Royals <laughs> team that I despise. I know, but we can just hate Bo- all Royals if you feel like it. I, I mean, the Bo Jackson Royals, I think we need to honor and acknowledge. Yeah, I got nothing against Zach Greinke. Zach Greinke wasn't on the 2014 squad. He's great. Yeah, Zach Greinke. Salvador okay. Perez. Salvador Perez can eat shit. <laughs> uh, Billy doesn't get that much more game time though, because the Tigers have a really strong team that year, and this rookie is only able to crack the lineup sparingly. He hits 258 over 71 plate appearances, because the Tigers finish with the best record in baseball and win the AL East. Fun fact: in the ALCS, they face the winner of the AL West, which was the Minnesota Twins, which means that. This was a AL East versus AL West championship of only Midwestern teams. Other than a late September call-up the next season, Billy spends most of 1988 in AAA with the Toledo Mud Hens, where coincidentally, he was teammates with the other Billy Bean. That had to get annoying. So <laughs> our Billy later said, quote, I'll never forget that Billy Bean. We both played in the outfield. I played center. He played left, and believe it or not, we had a right fielder named Pete Rice. Our outfield was coined <laughs> Rice and Beans. Unreal. <laughs> I thought you would enjoy that, James. Oh, holy frijoles. Apparently, the other Billy Bean was more famous for singing. Apparently, he, he was like the team singer and would just sing power ballads and rock songs on the road trips, and that made everyone happy because he was not really good, that Billy Bean. Our Billy was the best on the 1988 Mud Hens, batting slightly better than older Billy in every single category. Look, that was older Billy's last full season of the minors before retiring. And they, they would have been managed, because I'm going deep into my major league movie lore, but Lou Brown would have been managing those Toledo Mud Hens. Major League came out in like 91. It is 1989. 1989 is Major League. So if the movie came out in 89, then the season before, 88, Lou it's Brown It's pretty reasonable managing. to assume. Yeah, I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that he had been the manager the year before. Canonically, Lou Brown raised the team's spirits by talking about his two Billy Beans. Both of whom were, at that time, only famous for both being named Billy Bean. All right, let's go with that. I like it. 1989, our Billy is a strong start with the Mud Hens. Hit 315, gets called back up to the bigs. And then within a couple games, he gets traded to the Dodgers. He plays 51 games for the Dodgers, but he's, he hits sub-200. Before he gets demoted to PCL and the AAA Albuquerque Dukes. He spends the entire 1990 and 91 seasons with the Dukes. Pretty strong seasons both times. Then he gets an offer to move overseas. And he plays for the Kintetsu Buffaloes. And that only lasts seven games before he decides to go home. <laughs> Some people can't cut it, man. Some people aren't Randy Bass. There's Many no... people, frankly, aren't Randy yeah, Bass. Yeah, mo- I would say the vast majority of people are not Randy Bass. We know that at least twice as many people are Billy Bean than are Randy Bass. That we know of, yes. That is a fact of what we know, the known knowns, but not the unknown unknowns. We do not need to quote fucking Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush on this show. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. <laughs> but Billy Bean comes back to America, signs a minor league deal with the Padres, has a very strong start with the AAA Vegas Stars, hits 353, and he gets called back up to the majors, where he plays in 88 games for the Padres, his most ever big league games in a season, and he hits 260. And things are actually looking like good, finally kind of stable. But for reasons that we will get into a little later, his play then craters in 1994. And by 95, he's back in AAA. And at this time, he decides he just he doesn't have it in him, and he calls it quits and retires at the age of 31. Overall, he had played in 844 minor league games and 272 major league games. So after this, Billy Bean did what most career minor leaguers do and slipped away into obscurity. I thought you were going to say open a used car dealership. Well, maybe, but no, not this one. But at least he did for four years. Because in 1999, Billy Bean came back and did an interview with 
Lydia Martin of the Miami Herald, he came out as gay, becoming only the second former MLB player to come out after the deceased Glenn Burke of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Quote, For nine years, I felt as though I had one foot in the major leagues and one on a banana peel. Billy is very open about how much of a toll this put on him and the things he did to try to fit in. Quote, I dated girls on the road. I sat down and had drinks with them. I submerged myself in the world I needed to be in to play. I didn't sleep with any of the girls. You take it as far as you need to. People don't need to see things. To keep up this lie, he even got married once. But that didn't last, and he got divorced just a couple of years later. Eventually, he meets a man named Sam at a gym in 1993 and starts living with him. He keeps this relationship a secret, even refusing to let his brother stay at his house. And Sam would hide in a car whenever teammates dropped by. Like, this is how secretive they were. But then on April 23rd, 1995, Bean comes back from a, a game and finds that Sam is feverish and semi-conscious. Drives him to the hospital. Hospital originally would not admit him because Bean didn't have Sam's health insurance information and wasn't a family member or spouse. And Bean had to essentially demand that he be seen by like just saying that he'll just pay up front. Unfortunately, Sam dies of cardiac arrest from AIDS-related complications in the emergency room the next morning. Bean later said in an interview that he thought the doctors were squeamish because Sam was HIV positive. They didn't want to treat him because, again, this is 1995, and there's still a stigma around AIDS and HIV. I'm not going to say there isn't, but in 1995, it was like, I'm afraid to touch you because of that. Which is, like, obviously in and of itself absurd, but we can also go back to the NBA All-Star game that Magic Johnson played in. Sweating and running up and down a floor all game. And last I checked, no other members that were playing in that All-Star game contracted HIV. No, but there, I mean, there were people who thought that if they touched Magic Johnson, they would get HIV. Pe- like Carl one, Malone. people didn't know, and two, some people did know, but just were ignorant. People didn't want to, like, know anything about HIV other than, oh, it's the gay disease, like, stay away. Bad times. You know, no, no need to sugarcoat it. Bean remembers calling his mother crying, saying it's not fair, it's not fair, and her urging him to take a shower and go to the ballpark because she thought Sam was just a good friend of Billy's. And, you know, he he thought to himself, like, how can I explain to the club that I need a day off to grieve? No, No one knows, and I can't tell anybody. And so he just goes to play. After the game, gets called into the office, and gets sent back down to AAA Las Vegas. That's the worst day we've ever discussed, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a really bad day. He said, I swore to myself I would never again let baseball take precedence over my life. If I ever fell in love again, that relationship would come ahead of my career. Later that season, Bean gets called back up to the Padres, and he's with the team on a road trip to Miami, where he meets a man named Efrain Vega, who is a restaurateur who was famous for his Yucca restaurants in South Beach. They chat. Billy comes back to South Beach four months later. They meet again. And Vega convinces him, you have to at least tell your parents. So he goes home on Thanksgiving, goes to tell his mom. And she says, while he was trying to get the words out, I said, you're gay. We left the house and drank coffee in the car and both cried. I wonder what it would mean to him. Then Billy goes back inside to wake up his stepfather to, to tell him, And he just says, okay, now it's official. Can I go back to sleep? Like, he had always known that Billy was gay and just didn't care. Which, in the mid-90s, is probably the best you could hope for from anyone, especially a homicide cop. Like, a not very progressive position, I would say. So after this, after telling his parents, he's like, I just, I want to be true to myself. And he quits baseball, moves to Miami to live with Vega. They ran his restaurants together and sold real estate for nearly 13 years until they did break up in 2008, which is probably a good call on Billy's part because Vega would later go to jail for dealing meth after his restaurant empire crumbled. So he probably got out at the right time. I I, I mean, James, you were in the restaurant industry. I was in the restaurant industry. And I think it's no big secret. I don't think he became a meth dealer necessarily. (laughs) The methamphetamine industry and the restaurant industry are more linked than you may think. Reason number seven will shock you in my BuzzFeed article. 
so things are quiet for Billy for another six years. But then on July 15th, 2014, 19 years after leaving baseball, Bud Selig names Billy Bean as MLB's first ambassador for inclusion. His job was to work with major and minor league clubs to encourage equal opportunity in accordance with, you know, the joint MLB, MLBPA workplace code of conduct and help develop like educational trainings, initiatives against sexism, homophobia, and prejudice. And some of our listeners might remember that his first year doing this job, he was going around to different spring trainings and the Mets really wanted him to come by. Their GM at the time or assistant GM was Sandy Alderson, who was like very close with Billy and like wanted him to come talk. And then Daniel Murphy opened his homophobic ass mouth and said that I disagree with his lifestyle. I disagree with the fact that Billy's a homosexual and made himself look like the biggest asshole in the world. It, some of just the most ignorant comments ever. People brought it up three years later when he got traded to the Cubs too because of just the fact that he, he's never apologized for like being this like blatantly homophobic. He but, did get punished in having to finish his career with the Colorado Rockies, at least. I mean, there's just there's something particularly absurd about the line, like, I don't believe in it. Well, it's, I disagree with the fact that he's a homosexual. Well, even, like, that's even like more like, I disagree with the fact that he's a homosexual. Like, whether you like the fact that he is a homosexual or not, that is a fact. That I don't get. Like, what? Because he had such a great career in baseball, being dealing with his sexuality. Like, come on. Yeah. Murphy tried to say like that bullshit, like you can still accept him as a person, but I disagree with his life. No, you literally can't accept him as a person. Like that's the whole point of it. And Billy took the high road, as you might expect someone who had to live in the closet for so long and has dealt with the stuff that he's dealt with. Talked about how Murphy's comments made him want to work harder and be a better example that someday it might allow Murphy to view things from his perspective, even if just for a moment. Definitely the high road for this. And Billy Bean's still doing this stuff. Currently, he's the uh, senior vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion for MLB. He's been elected to the National Gay and Lesbian Hall of Fame, named the Outsports Male Hero of the Year, who said that, quote, he has taken his position in Major League Baseball and made leaps and bounds for LGBT equality and visibility in the sport. He was the perfect person for the job. Today, Billy's still only one of three major leaguers to have ever come out, along with Burke and TJ House, who came out late last year. But he's been working really hard to make the baseball sphere like more comfortable place for gay athletes. And in the past year or two, we've had like a handful of minor leaguers come out. Like statistically, just everyone should always keep in mind, there are more gay players. And even with all this, they're still not out there. And so it is wonderful what you're saying about the movement towards that. Yeah. And so David Denson, who was a ex-minor leaguer, who came out a couple of years ago, he credited having Bean to talk to and like lean on before publicly coming out as the reason why he was comfortable doing so. And uh, ex-Washington Nationals executive Steve Reed did the same, talked to Bean, got comfortable like speaking to him, and then came out publicly after that. So that's kind of what he's been doing, trying to just make a more comfortable place for baseball players. They don't have to deal with what he dealt with. And is it perfect? No, of course not. There's still a long way to go, but from everything I looked into, baseball seems to be by far the, the best of the like major sports in America for coming out, like, you know, safety for gay athletes. It's not a high bar, but it's better than every other one. And a lot of it is due to Billy Bean. I can agree more that like in a relative sense, yes, they have made the most progress. And it does sound like he gets a good amount of credit for that. Touche. Just one little anecdote I did want to talk about. This was from an interview that came out after Moneyball, the movie, came out. And first of all, a lot of his friends thought it was him. Were like, oh my god, Brad Pitt's going to be playing you. How do you feel? And he had to explain to everyone, not me, it's the other guy. And he gets other Billy Bean baseball cards in the mail asking for his signature. <laughs> and he always just writes back, sorry, you have the wrong Billy Bean. Th this was one quote that I found funny in like like a very self-aware way this was from an interview with out sports talking about back when moneyball was coming out quote at the time as i was becoming more and more recognized as a member of the lgbt community i was sure that billy was getting the short end of the stick it was okay for me to be confused with the general manager of a major league baseball team 
Wasn't so sure how he felt about people thinking that he was the, quote, gay baseball player. He's a straight Republican who's married with kids, and I'm a gay Democrat with two Jack Russell Terriers. And I just, I love the self-awareness of, like, you know, confuse me with Billy Bean all you want. But he's not the kind of guy who would be happy being me, so he's probably not happy about that. And I was like, that's, like, self-deprecating humor that I appreciate, especially the, the two Jack Russell Terriers part. We love stereotypical tiny dogs. Hey, they're good. They're good. Meet, and we love guys that find later acceptance and help to pursue that acceptance for others with their post playing career. And we like Billy Bean, but maybe not the other Billy Bean. And other Billy Bean's still fine. Like it's baseball, man. If we started hating all Republicans in baseball, <laughs> there would not be any baseball left. The, the two thousand twenty-two Taro Fujinami. Do we know that? Do we know what Shintaro Fujinami's feelings on, say, Shinzo Abe were? 22 fills would be a lot harder for me to root for. Just Would just there be Aaron any Nola. 22 just fills? Aaron Nola. <laughs> I think we could get, like, uh, like, a Brandon Marsh is both sides are bad guy. I think that's as close as we can get. <laughs> okay, you're settling for the CNN crowd? I think we gotta take what we can get. Well, I'll tell you what I could take right now is Diaz, the frequently mistaken identity person that you are bringing to the table this week. For sure. So when we came up with this, I think I pretty quickly claimed basketball. And there were two ways that I could go. The first one that I considered was Irvin Johnson. Irvin, not Magic Johnson. He was a center, quit basketball in 10th grade, grew eight inches by his senior year of high school was noticed at the local supermarket and the coach said, hey, you should come play for my basketball team again. From there, he went to New Orleans, turns it into a 13-year NBA career as a backup center. A very interesting story in its own right, but it's not the story that I wanted to tell today. Instead, I want to talk about one of the few people who has a more famous basketball name than Irvin Johnson. This guy's not from North Carolina. He's not 6'6". He is a guard. He did wear number 23. And his name is Michael Jordan. And we're going to talk about Oscar-nominated actor Michael B. Jordan's brief NBA career now. No, let's be very clear. There is no known middle name for this Michael Jordan. And I want to really specify... No middle name? No known middle name. Because I really want to just... I want to specify this. If you go to his Wikipedia page, it's going to say Michael hyphen Hakeem Jordan. And there's a line in there that says he was upset with always being confused with the other famous Michael Jordan basketball. So he hyphenated it and he put Hakeem on there. <laughs> this section has no citation. There is no other record anywhere on the internet of him referring to himself as Michael Hakeem. It seems that somebody just made some shit up and went on his Wikipedia page and put that there. So allow us to set the record straight and clear on this podcast of the highest journalistic integrity there is no Michael Hakeem Jordan. There is no Michael Hakeem Jordan. Why did Jordan. they also pick another top pick from that draft for their second first name? Well, they also spelled it with an I instead of two E's. So, like, you know, they wanted some plausible deniability in there. Like, whoever did this really thought it through. Um, My name is Michael Hakeem Sam Bowie Jordan. Now, maybe his middle name is Hakeem. It might be. All I know is... There's no citation on that Wikipedia page. There's nowhere else on the internet that it says that. And there's nowhere where he refers to himself as Michael Hakeem or anybody refers to him as Michael Hakeem. But he did want a little bit of separation. So he did largely go by Mike. So Mike Jordan is really who we're going to be talking about today. Mike Jordan was born June 24th, 1977 in Philadelphia. Uh, he's a Philly boy. Grew up with a lot of his basketball experience coming on the playgrounds. Philly, especially in the 80s, had a very notorious outdoor basketball scene. And when you're playing on the streets, you're not going to have coaches necessarily, but you're going to have the older players on the court who command respect on the court, you look to for guidance. So a couple of those guys that helped to guide him, uh, there's Alvin Williams. Alvin Williams would go on to play at Nova parlayed it into a 10-year NBA career. He was a starter on the 01 Raptors that pushed the Sixers to seven games uh, when Vince Carter missed that shot right at the end. Uh, he was also mentored by Temple student Rick Brunson, 
Rick Brunson was a big influence for Mike Jordan growing up. Hopefully nothing about massage parlors in there. <laughs> but as long as it was just about basketball ability, Rick Brunson, a good mentor. And when it came time for him to start playing basketball formally, they wanted to find a good program for him to play in. Some of the public schools in Philly don't have the best basketball, but there's a very good private, uh, you know, the Catholic League is really good. He wouldn't play in the Catholic League, but he would play in the Friends League. So the Friends League consists of basically all the Quaker schools that kind of surround the Philadelphia suburbs. So he goes to Abington Friends. You also got West Town Friends. There's nine of them total. Would the site Rivals.com be allowed to track statistics that were uh, in the Friends League? Or is Rivals.com barred from counting anything in the Friends League? I'm not sure as far as modern record keeping. I do know that finding records of any stats that Mike Jordan accrued throughout high school was very difficult. Um, I wasn't able to track anything down, actually. Is Friends Central in the Friends League? They are. Yeah, Friends Central is in the yeah, Friends that's League. My, that's my local school. One thing that I did love when you go to the Friends League website, one of the first things on their thing is their transgender student athlete policy. You might worry with a religious institution what this is, but allow me to read directly from it. Unequivocally, they state, the Friends School League affirms that transgender and gender expansive students should be fully welcomed and supported as student athletes in the league. Specifically, transgender students are welcome to participate on the teams that align with their gender identity. Well, the Quakers are usually kind of chill. So they're, yeah, they've got a that's, pretty good track. It's, it's not like they're the like they're Protestants or like evangelicals. The Qu Quakers are usually the chillest of the. They're like, not fake Christians. No, certainly not. So we have uh, we had Germantown friends, we had Morristown friends, Friends Central uh, won the twenty three baseball championship. Xavier, the Shipley School, of course. Who could forget the Shipley School Academy of the New Church? There's some real powerhouses here. But we're predominantly focused on Abington Friends. Abington Friends is, in the 90s, the dominant program in the Friends League. They've won three straight by the time that he joins as a freshman. And that might be why, much like his name counterpart, his freshman year, Mike Jordan does not make the varsity. He gets cut and instead has to play with the JV. Team still goes on to win a championship this year. Sophomore year, starts coming into a role more. He's like a, a big piece off the bench. They win their fifth straight Friends League title. As a junior and senior, he starts, he gets the shine, and they win two more Friends League titles. So throughout his entire time there, they win all four. They would win seven straight. They'd win one more the year after he graduated before their streak was finally ended. Largely untouchable in the Friends League while Mike Jordan's there. And he's starting to get a lot of attention from some Philadelphia schools. He would spend a lot of his summers training on Drexel's campus at the DAC. And Drexel made an offer to him. Uh, Drexel was interested in Mike Jordan, but instead he would choose to go about five blocks further south down 33rd Street. He loved playing in the Friends League so much. He loved being a Quaker so much that why not enroll at Penn and join the Penn Quakers basketball program? Penn was dominant in the 90s. But at the time that he enters Penn, they've actually just lost the Ivy League title for the first time in quite some time. Princeton, their main rival, won the title that year. This is the year that Princeton beat UCLA 41-59, one of the biggest upsets in NCAA tournament history. Starring but, the coach of the most recent upset Princeton team. Star yeah, exactly. Yeah, starring um, Mitch Henderson. Yes, Mitch Henderson. So Mitch Henderson was on that team. On the bench, the coach at the time was a Princeton legend, Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll, that's how you say it. Mm -hmm. So Pete Carroll was the head coach for that team that pulled off the upset over UCLA. But going into Mike Jordan's freshman year at Penn, Princeton has a new coach at the helm. Uh, Pete Carroll retired. So now it was Bill Carmody was, was coaching Princeton. So freshman year, they know what the goal is. The goal is to beat Princeton. Mike Jordan doesn't have the freshman year struggles that he had at Abington Friends. He immediately steps into a pretty significant role, starts 17 out of 29 games. 
And for freshmen to even play period at Penn in the 90s is borderline unheard of. So the fact that he's even getting playing time is impressive in and of itself. His numbers are pretty good. Uh, he plays 31 minutes a game, averages 12 points, four boards, three assists. But it's a down year for Penn. They go 12 and 14, finish fourth in the Ivy, going eight and six, while Princeton runs the table. They go 14 and 0 to dominate the Ivy League and route to another NCAA tournament bid. That's simply unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And Mike Jordan took that personally when he came back sophomore year. Steps his numbers up a little bit. He's playing 36 minutes a game now. Averages 15 points, four boards, five assists. Classic all-around point guard. Doing a little bit of everything out there. Penn takes a big step forward this year. They go 17-12. and Finish 10-4 and in the Ivy League, which is good enough only for second. Princeton goes 14-0 and again. This is now two consecutive years that Princeton has not lost an Ivy League game. They were an absolute super team. They were ranked as high as eight in the polls that year. That's wild. So this is just in a stretch where Princeton is about the standard for mid-major basketball. They finished 10 out of 12 years with the best uh, defensive rating in college basketball. They're kind of a little bit ahead of the curve in that they're shooting the three ball at a high volume, but they're also playing at a slow pace. So less possessions, lots of threes. High variance team, but with those good old Ivy League fundamentals, Princeton's like a powerhouse at this point. That year, Princeton would be kind of underseeded as a five. They would beat UNLV in the first round, uh, but then they would lose to a Michigan State team that was the four seed that would go on to the final four in the second round. Tight fought game, but there could be some light at the end of the tunnel for those preying on Princeton's downfall because reigning conference player of the year, the man in the middle, Steve Goodrich, the center, he's graduating, and the door is now open. Penn has a chance to reclaim Ivy League glory. Junior year, Mike Jordan's average is almost identical to what he put up sophomore year. He's just a very steady starting point guard at this point. 15-4-5, but we're not worried about the individual stats. We're worried about slaying the beast that is this Princeton Tigers team. When we get to their midseason matchup. And it's also important to note in the traditional Ivy League schedule format, the teams are paired. So Penn and Princeton are a pair. Cornell and Columbia are a pair. Harvard and Yale are a pair. And then Dartmouth and Brown are a pair. So the way it works is you will spend one weekend either going to another pod or having a pod visit you. um, And that's how you get your home and away. And then Mid-season, you're going to have a matchup with your rival. And the last game of the season, you're going to have a matchup with your rival. And they'll play those generally midweek. This one would be played on a Tuesday on February 9th, 1999. Princeton started a little slow this year, but they're coming off of a 6-0 start in the Ivy League, which was spurred on by winning a mid-season tournament where they beat some teams that were no slouches. Florida State was in that tournament. So Princeton's hot. They're 6-0. Penn also enters at 6-0 uh, as the Tigers make the trip to the Palestra. Big game. Starts off good for Princeton. Brian Earl, who is still to this day the Ivy League career record holder for three-point percentage, does what he always did, sinks a three, and Princeton goes up 3 nothing. Immediately, Fran Dunphy, Penn coach, Steve Donahue's on the sidelines. They know we got to start shutting down Brian Earl. So they keep Brian Earl off the scoreboard until there's five minutes left in the first half. Real good streak of shutting down this great three-point shooter. The thing is, it's not just that they kept Brian Earl off the scoreboard. They kept Princeton off of the scoreboard for the next 15 minutes of the game. Penn responds with a 29-0 run to go up 29-3 with five minutes left in the first half. How many failed possessions is that for Princeton? That's what I need to know. How many times do they fail at scoring during that period? Mathematically speaking, it has to be at least 16. It's yeah. probably closer to like 25. That's the Dunphy that Temple thought they were getting. That's the Dunphy that Temple thought they were getting. 29-3 with five minutes left in the first half. It's 33-9 at halftime. And by the time we're two minutes into the second half, it's 40-13. to 13, Largest lead of the game. There's no drama. 
except the Fran Dunphy that Temple did get is who showed up for the rest of this game. Over the next 16 minutes, Princeton goes on a 35-9 to run of their own, and it's now only 49-48 Penn with two minutes left in the game. I would be apoplectic. And mental breakdowns are happening across the city of Philadelphia at this point. And they only get worse when Steve Goodrich's replacement, who is a freshman, Chris Young, gets the ball in the low block, puts up a hook shot that gives Princeton just their second lead of the game at 50 to 49. Both teams are missing the rest of the way until it finally comes down. Penn has the ball. One last chance to salvage this game. And Mike Jordan does what Michael Jordan does in big moments. If my shot's there, I'm going to take it, but I'm not afraid to pass it to John Paxson. I'm not afraid to pass it to Steve Kerr. I can let my teammate take the shot, and I'll let him make it. Unfortunately for Mike Jordan, John Paxson wasn't on his team. Steve Kerr wasn't on his team. <laughs> Matt Langle was on his team. Matt Langle gets an open jumper right at hey, the I like I like Matt Langle. I like Matt Langle, too. But, but are in we this about moment, to like him less? Matt Langle, his shot hits every part of the rim, pops out. The ball falls into Chris Young's hands as the clock expires. And Princeton has pulled off the most shocking comeback in the history of Ivy League basketball. 50-49 to over those Penn Quakers. 40-13 to should be as well known as 28-3. I had something in there that I was going to say about that. Like, if you thought Falcons-Patriots was a bad blown lead with 18 minutes remaining... Let me tell you about another blown lead with 18 minutes remaining in a game. That missed shot is more that Temple hired Adam Fisher instead of Matt Langle. Well, I mean, and this is like, just imagine, we can imagine as fans, but it's even harder to imagine. Imagine being a player on that team. Imagine getting your ass kicked by Princeton for two straight years, knowing that they are undefeated in conference play. If you're Mike Jordan, you've never seen Princeton lose a conference game, and it's your junior year. And you just had them 29 to three and you blew it. This could have been a turning point for both teams. And in a way it was. Penn gains resolve. They win their next six conference games. So they're 12 and one. Princeton may have emotionally exhausted themselves in that game. Their next game, they go up to Yale. They lose in double overtime, 60 to 58 to finally end their reign of terror over the Ivy League. (laughs) They would also lose another game later this season at Harvard in overtime. So no regulation losses still. But the important thing is they're 11-2. and two. Penn's 12-1, and one, and it's time for the return match at Jadwin Gymnasium. Princeton wins. Both teams are 12-2. and two. Princeton has the tiebreaker via 2-0 and o record. They would once again claim the conference championship and advance to the NCAA tournament. But Penn has a chance to go do what no team in the Ivy League has done in three years, which is win at Princeton. Kind of the same script as the first game. Penn jumps out to a real big lead. The only difference is this time, there's no drama to this one. They go into Jadwin and they whip some Tiger. (laughs) Final score is 73 to 48. I can't find any box scores from this game, but up and down, it's just a thorough beating of Princeton. It is a vanquishing of the beast. And... Penn, after three long years of not winning the Ivy League like they're so used to doing, they reclaim it, they win the Ivy League again, and kind of on the back of the success that Princeton's had, Penn's seeded pretty well going into the tournament. They're an 11 seed. They're matched up against Florida, and they lose their opening round game, 75-61. Senior year, you vanquished the beast, Mike Jordan, but now coming off that season, They're not just worried about just winning the Ivy League. They're not worried about just beating Princeton. They want to go on a run of their own through the Ivy League. Mike Jordan, we know what we're getting from him. He's going to average 15 points, four rebounds, and five assists again for the third year in a row. Third year in a row with exactly those averages. Not exactly. I did some rounding. But roughly those averages. It's pretty good. Very consistent. Is everything you're looking for from a point guard. Penn starts the season a little tough. They played a a very difficult non-conference schedule, so they went 6-7 and out of the gate. But there's no bad losses in there. There's a good win at Cal. And the team's just focused on dominating conference play. That's exactly what they do. 
They have an average margin of victory of 17.8 throughout the season, including a nine-point win at Jadwin in February, and then the return match, a 21-point blowout of the Tigers at Penn on senior night. That would move them to 14-0 and in Ivy League play. They've pulled the Princeton. They've done exactly what Mike Jordan witnessed in the first two years. They go 14-0, and and they run the table in conference. You would think maybe they get a better seed because of this. No, they actually get seeded as a 13. They get matched up against Illinois, and they battle. It's a good, tight game throughout, but ultimately Illinois does pull away. They win 71-61 to end the collegiate career of Mike Jordan. No respect for the nerds with seeding. I'd, I'd be curious to see the actual math behind it, but I feel like the Ivies outperform their seed as consistently, if not more so, than any other mid-major. Well, like the 10 to 13 range is the peak range for an upset because it's just where your opponent is also going to be in a weird, we don't know exactly where to set your position. Right. I feel like either very strong mid-major conference winners or very disappointing major conference teams is usually where those are. Look, it was it was a great collegiate career. And, you know, Mike Jordan could be satisfied with that. But just like his counterpart, not satisfied. Got to go press for more. He tries out for both the Sixers and the Celtics, but unlike Bo Cruz, doesn't stick in the NBA. He does have a pretty robust international career, though, as a player. So I'm going to take you on the tour of Mike Jordan. First, we're going to play in the French League. We're going to play for Besançon BCD. Then we're going to come back home. We're going to play in Trenton for the Trenton Shooting Stars of the International Basketball League. Then we'll go over to Spain. We'll play for Mercia. Then we'll accept the transfer to Venezuela to play for Margarita. (laughs) Then he goes to play in Germany for QTSV Quackenbrook, also known as the Artland Dragons. Then we go to Latvia, where he plays for Ventspils. We go back to Germany, where he plays for the Köln 99ers. Plays in Italy for Palacentro Cantu. We spent some time in Greece. We go back to Germany. We go to Israel for a little bit. And he finally finishes off back in Germany playing for Geisen 46ers. Go Sixers. Do you think he felt at home with them a little bit? I would like to hope so. Let me see if I can pull up their jerseys. They wear red, white, and black. So it's a little adjacent. Plus, he's been, um, I mean, Germany probably feels like as much of a home as he has not in America by that point. For sure. And the, the one thing that he was very noted for when playing in Europe is European coaches would say, you're the most European American we've ever had. Basically saying a lot of these guys come over here and try to be the superstar and jack up shots and go hero ball because they think they're so much better. Mike Jordan knows what Mike Jordan's role is. Mike Jordan is here to make his team better and to play winning basketball. Mike Jordan knows he's not Michael Jordan. Mike Jordan knows he's not Michael Jordan. Exactly. I think that's a great way to put it. One thing I should mention about like his numbers. So he, when he first started in high school, he wore 13. But it was essentially through the peer pressure of his teammates. A senior who wore 23 graduated. And they're like, dude, come on. Like, come on. <laughs> you got to have the Jordan 23 jersey. Your name is Michael Jordan. You got to wear 23. And he said, you know, at that point, he started kind of just embracing it. There was a segment when he was at Penn that Stuart Scott did, and it was comparing the Michael Jordans. And it basically just became a roast Mike Jordan segment because it would be, hey, watch Mike Jordan miss this 18 foot jumper. Watch Michael Jordan make an 18 foot jumper from the same spot. Like this was a thing that Stuart Scott would do. Just Um, being rude. More or less, but. Mike Jordan, you know, took it all in good stride. He had that 11-year career bouncing all across Europe and also Venezuela for a little bit. By the time that he's done with his playing career, he's feeling like he's about ready to step into a coaching job. And this is where we're going to go back to Xavier's favorite teammate of Mike Jordan's ever, Matt Langle, who is the head coach at Colgate and happens to have an opening on his bench uh, as an assistant. So Mike Jordan... Joins as an assistant for Colgate. Colgate 
has had the most success they've ever had as a basketball program under Matt Langle. Mike Jordan has a little bit of something to do with that. In 2020, he had a chance to come back home for a year and to step into a larger role with the Drexel program. So he goes back where it all started. He's a Drexel assistant. Drexel goes to the NCAA tournament in 2021 for the first time in quite a number of years. So with that, now Mike Jordan's ready to come back to Colgate now as the lead assistant. Spends one year there. And after that, there is going to be an opening at Lafayette because Fran O'Hanlon, who is another Philly guy, was the coach at Lafayette from 95. So starting even before Mike Jordan's collegiate career, Fran O'Hanlon was the head coach at Lafayette. But when he retires, Lafayette figures, let's bring in another Philly guy. Let's get Mike Jordan to be our head coach. So they hire Mike Jordan. Seasons doesn't start too great for Lafayette. Ends up going a lot, lot worse for Mike Jordan because he gets placed on administrative leave on Ooh. February 21st due to a complaint that was filed against him. He would finally be released from his contract exactly one year after he signed it on March 29th, 2023. He was fired. Now, the program has kept it very tight to the vest as to what is the nature of these complaints from anonymous sourcing from reports. It seems like it comes down to Mike Jordan has a intense personality as a coach, which may sometimes cross over a line. There are no specifics mentioned by anybody, but there are anonymous sources that say Mike was nothing but good to me when he was my assistant coach. And there's other anonymous sources that say, you know what? I'm not really surprised that this happens. We as, don't know specifics. As it's been said, he's very European. He's very European. And there's no specifics to any of the allegations, so it would be reckless for us to speculate. So we won't do that. But if it is due to a certain intensity that he displayed, I think we would say that he's not the only MJ with maybe some unhealthy thought patterns as it relates to competition and basketball. But just like that, Michael Jordan, our Mike Jordan, started from humble beginnings, knew what his role was, worked his way up, wanted to slay the beast at Princeton, Suffered the most crushing defeat possibly imaginable in basketball, but then still rebounded from that. And they never lost another Ivy League game in his career after that. Uh, I think it's worth it noting. Left a very bad taste in their mouth. It, it left a horrible taste in their mouth. They wanted to make sure they never had that again. And they never did because of their leader, because of their captain. From Philadelphia, at guard, six foot. Number 23, Michael Jordan. Let's keep it straight. It is Mike Jordan, not Michael Jordan, but that's impressive. I, I am a little sad he never got an NBA minute. I wish he could have gotten a token appearance or something, maybe some G League time, but still an excellent story. I mean, like, when the Wizards had Michael Jordan the second time, like, they weren't winning anything. You could have given Mike Jordan a 10-day just to have you two have Michael Jordans on the, the court. Bit. Yeah, exactly. Just for the bit. Make it a free t-shirt giveaway night. You get to choose which Michael Jordan jersey you want and only print a few of the one because otherwise it's the one everyone's going to pick. I think in that case, you would have to have Mike Jordan wear 32, right? Like that's, yeah. Yeah. that's the only number that would make sense. Missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity, but listen, we, we've heard about Billy Bean. We've heard about Mike Jordan. Last I checked, there are three guys that we are to discuss this week. So I'd love to hear about famous name, less famous guy, number three, James. Well, sure. And uh, as I went out to kind of hit the mines in search of a rich vein to tap into for this, I found the name Eddie Murray, Orioles legend, of course, Hall of Famer, top 15 hitter of all time. He's a 3,500 guy. So uh, I would say pretty safe to say up there. His number 33 is retired by the Orioles. List of honors goes on. And he is not the only Eddie Murray. There is an Ed Murray who played in the same franchise, the St. Louis Browns, had exactly one plate appearance, struck out. Despite this, for whatever reason, he is described as being 5'6 and well-known for his power. There was a fourth-tier English footballer for the Rovers in the late 80s named Eddie Murray. And there was also Edward James Murray, who is an Aboriginal rugby player who had a mysterious quote-unquote suicide in a New South Wales drunk tank at one point. 
This was later investigated by a royal commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. So it definitely like got some attention. But today I am not going to start in Australia, despite what you all may be expecting. Instead, we are heading to a different former British colony with a history of anti-Indigenous violence, Canada. I had a feeling. On February 24th, 1956, Orioles legend Eddie Murray is born in Los Angeles. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, on August 29th, just about six months later, Eddie Murray is born. And we are going to be sticking with this Eddie Murray. We don't care about Eddie Murray. We want to focus on Eddie Murray, who is starting in Halifax on the East Coast, but very quickly moving over to the left coast to Victoria, British Columbia, where he attends a pretty new school, Spectrum Community School for high school. He is the only notable alumnus in the sports world on their page. Only one to have come out of there that goes on to an athletic career. And while there, he plays soccer, track, rugby, cricket. None of those are the sport that he is going to play professionally. Uh, In fact, the sport that he is going to play professionally is not offered at his high school. But after high school, he graduates. He gets a job driving a forklift in the lumber yard. And in his free time, in addition to the other sports he's already a fan of, He does discover gridiron football. He's starting to move here into the west of Canada now. There's a Lower Island Junior Varsity League that he's playing in. The Sonic Hornets, S-A-A-N-I-C-K, unfortunately. Not Sonic Hornets, which would be fucking badass. Not that good, but it is a pretty good team that he's playing for. He loves soccer. That's his first love. And so he does the most basic thing he can in football, which is kicking. At this point, while he's there, he starts to get a little decent at kicker. So he goes to this development camp that a BC Lions coach was running, Willard Wells. He's a native of BC. And he basically, like, as a college coach, says, hey, you know what? You haven't gone to college yet. You're just kind of bumming around. Come play NCAA football. A quick history lesson. In the 16 and 1700s, there was a French ethnic group that settled in the eastern portion of Canada, often around Halifax, Nova Scotia. They were called the Acadians. When the British come in and take over that portion of Canada, they get forced to move to a different big French population center in North America. And once they get there, the local accent transforms Acadian into Cajun. It's because that Cajun food's so spicy. It's so spicy. And I bring this up because he now, like the Cajuns, is going to have started in Halifax, Nova Scotia and find his way in New Orleans, Louisiana. He is going to attend Tulane University. Roll wave. Roll Wave. And as a member of the Green Wave, he does not have to wait long to start making an impact. He is the starter by his sophomore year as their place kicker. 54.5%, just fine at this point. And it's only going to keep getting better. He falls just 0.2% short of what would have been an incredibly nice 69, only 68.8% his senior year. Uh, We can round it up. We'll round it up. We, well, we don't need to round up. Hold on. 62 and a half for his college career on field goals. And by the time he leaves, he basically holds every single school record. 45 field goals, 219 points. He only misses two extra points in his entire college career, making 95.17 or 67 of his total 69 attempts. So there we go. Don't worry. He had us in the end. Very nice. Those first two years, Tulane goes a combined 7-15. They get up to nine and three his senior year. And so come 1980, he is on the radar of pro teams. And I do mean all pro teams because first off in February 20th, 1980, just short of a 24th birthday of Eddie Murray, different Eddie Murray is drafted in the CFL draft 26th overall by the Hamilton Tiger Cats. At this point, he has not gotten an invitation to like the NFL draft combine. They have his stats and his agent's like, maybe we think it's worth holding out. We think it's good enough odds you get drafted that we wait until the NFL won before you sign any CFL contract. And good thing that he did, because when we get to April 30th, in the seventh round, the Detroit Lions get things kicked off with the 166th overall pick, which is used to select Eddie Murray. A little bit of spoiler, he is the very latest pro bowler taken in this draft. There it started seventh round. Though one player later, I must acknowledge, Xavier, your Jets do make an excellent move for this show by taking Guy Bingham as a center. Now, the Lions have a kicker on their roster at this point, Benny Ricardo, and he is the first ever NFL player from Paraguay, just for what it's worth. He and Detroit had already had a little bit of a contract dispute coming into this, and them bringing in competition during training camp pretty much ends the tenure of Benny Ricardo. And so as a rookie, Eddie Murray, or as he is known right now, the two-lane toe, he is going to be the starter for the Detroit Lions entering this season. You used to have great nicknames. You had the two-lane toe, 
You had the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech, who I still don't know who that actually is. I just know the nickname because <laughs> it's that awesome. Um, and he's going to earn another nickname pretty soon on because he starts off pretty great. It's 1980. Detroit goes nine and seven. They're fine. But it is apparent that they've got a heck of a kicker from the jump. He leads the league in both field goal attempts and field goals made here in his rookie season with 42 attempts, 27 makes. Longs of those is 52 yards. Pro Bowl as a rookie and first team all pro goes to the Pro Bowl and he becomes the first and as far as I can tell, only ever rookie Pro Bowl MVP as a kicker. 1981, another very solid year, 25 out of 35 attempts. One of those on November 15th, 1981. It's a barn burner of a buzzer beater. They are tied on the road in Dallas and they don't have time to get into field goal formation to make this game winning field goal. So they basically kick the field goal out of like a standard under center formation. (laughs) Uh, And it knocks the Cowboys out. He drills every single extra point from 1981 through 1984. And in 1983 also sets the Lions franchise record for the longest field goal at the time, 54 yards. This whole time he's 50% from 50 yards out or more. And his roughly 75% field goal average, like upper half the league. He is a great kicker. This is why he starts to earn the name Eddie Money with the Detroit faithful. In 1982, he does make his first trip to the playoffs. There's a little bit of an asterisk there. This is a strike expanded playoffs. They get fucking molly whopped in the first round, 31-7. So we don't need to worry about that one. In 1983, next year, when he makes that longest field goal in franchise history, they make it to the playoffs once again. And Detroit falls behind 14-3 pretty early, but they battle back. Murray field goals are primarily all the scoring that they've got going on, including a 54 yarder. Unfortunately, he does miss an equally long 50 plus yard chance to win it at the end, but he is having a phenomenal career in Detroit and it does only continue. Even if that is pretty much the end of his playoff career with Detroit sets a couple more records in 85 and 86 has the longest streak of field goals made in lions franchise history and uh, eventually has the season in 86 with the most total points by a kicker in, or any player in Lions franchise history. In 88 and 89, volume goes down a little bit, but something gets into him. He leads the entire league in percentage both years, making 20 of his 21 attempts, 95.2% both of those years. He gets a second Pro Bowl and a second team All-Pro nod in that second one, so... Now we have had like a full decade of Eddie Murray being one of the best kickers in the NFL. And it will pretty much be the end of that period because in 1990, it's his age 34 season, gets a hip injury, misses five games. And uh, first off, for the first time ever, he is not the leading scorer for the Lions in his career. It's instead some guy named Barry Sanders. And uh, he drops down to (laughs) 67.9%. Lions set up a contingency plan. They draft another Pacific Northwesterner in the second round, Jason Hansen, who is going to play for Detroit for 21 years after this is the kicker. I had totally like blank Jason Hansen out of my mind. So they do at least get it right when they replace Eddie Murray. But it is time for him to replace Eddie Murray and eventually shatter all those franchise records. And this begins the Roman Ronin period for Eddie Murray, as I've decided to call it. Also, Diaz, I found out what the rambling wreck is. It just means it's all, Georgia, it's all Georgia Tech students. The rambling wreck means every student and alumni of Georgia Tech. Well, it, it, the, the manifestation of it is a 1930 Model T. Model A. Uh, whatever. Who cares? <laughs> we haven't even gotten a T yet, baby. It's a model. Not even a real car. It's just a model. So to start the 1992 season, Eddie Murray is, he's a Ronin. He is a man without a team. But in October, Kansas City's Nick Lowry gets hurt. And so they sign him off the street to fill in. And in one game, kicks exactly one field goal, 52 yards, and is then released by the Kansas City Chiefs. After this, Tampa needs some help with their kicking situation. Ken Willis, he isn't injured. He just sucks. So he finishes out the season with Tampa and has a solid training camp, but they do decide to go in a different direction. Luckily, Dallas also figures that they have a kicker that sucks after two games the next season. So they bring him in after no two start and in 14 games, he actually sets a career high for field goals made in a season with 28 sets two franchise records with Dallas, most field goals in one game, five of them against the Packers and then two 50 plus yarders. First time that had ever been done versus the Minnesota Vikings. Then the regular season finale, 
kicks a game-winning field goal, not against Dallas this time, for Dallas against New York Giants to win the division and get home seeding through the playoffs. That ends up being a huge deal for Dallas. They ride that home seeding and, for what it's worth, a 6-for-6 performance from our boy, Eddie Murray, to a Super Bowl 28 ring. Eddie Murray is a Super Bowl champion. Make sure you put that respect on his name. (laughs) I... The, the respect that I have for the Super Bowl champion is immediately disqualified by who he won it for. But good news, Diaz, it's going to immediately come back because the next year he loves this NFC East life and he wants to join the Philadelphia Eagles. I, I'm getting DeMarco Murray energy from this. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Uh, <laughs> but he is uh, he's signed to replace Roger Ruzek. And he has another really good year with the Birds. He's 21 for 25, 33 extra points is all of the ones that he attempts. After this season, though, he's a Canadian-born legend, as I already mentioned. He supplanted the league's first Paraguayan. In another level of international intrigue, he himself is now supplanted by the first ever South African NFL player, Gary Anderson. So he is cut July 22nd, 1995. And two weeks later, the Washington football team says, we like what this kid can do in the NFC East. We want to bring him back. So for his third straight year, he's with a different NFC East team. It is another solid season, but much like the other two stops, it is a one-year stint. 1996 comes and goes. No one calls. And, you know, you figure it's probably the end for old Eddie Murray. Actually, September 20th, 1997, Eddie Murray retires. Psych, that's baseball Eddie Murray. Football Eddie Murray still has some shit to prove. And four days after Eddie Murray retires... Eddie Murray signs with the Minnesota Vikings and have a week five matchup against his former employers, the Philadelphia Eagles. And after over a year away from the sport, he goes 12 for 17 on field goals the rest of the way, 23 out of 24 extra points versus the New York Giants in the wild card round this time. He hits another game winning field goal. Eddie Money absolutely delivers for the Vikings before they get smacked around by the Niners in the next round. And then as it was in 1995, He is immediately cut and replaced by Gary Anderson again. He sits out the 98-99 season. And for real this time, he does retire on June 2nd, 1999. Signs a one-day contract with Detroit to retire as a Lion. This is a heartfelt ending. He and his wife, Cindy, they've just had their newborn daughter, Nicole, in the last couple of years. He's ready to hang it up for about six months until Richie Cunningham hurts his ankle and the Dallas Cowboys call the only guy that can save their season, Eddie Murray, who does come back and finish out the last four games of the season. But now, no, for real, he's done. Until the Washington football team, upset with Michael Houston, who I just want to say is the guy that replaced Eddie Murray back in Tampa when they didn't bring him back after the first season. He's been around for so long that now teams are getting fed up with him and they're calling Eddie Murray in to replace him. This is 44-year-old Eddie Murray at this point being called into Washington. Life of a kicker. It's what it is. He is now out of retirement for the fourth time, trying to beat Derek Torres at that upper level. He is the oldest player in the league while he's there. He goes eight for 12. The age is really starting to show at this point. And so actually, no for real, I do not have any more Sykes. This is the retirement of football Eddie Murray. All told, played 250 total games. When he retired, that was the record for the most by anyone in the NFL born in Canada 174 of them were with the Detroit Lions. He really like put up a career with them. And then 76 between the other six teams between that 1992 and 2000 Roman Ronin period. During a 20 year career, 75 and a half field goal percentage topped by only 17 kickers with at least a hundred games or more through 2000. All but one of them debuted after him. He is currently 23rd still all time in scoring in the NFL. And when he retired, he was 16th. He is second in line history, only to Jason Hansen, who again put up 21 years with one franchise. So like, what the fuck are you going to do against that? And he remained a like totally beloved figure in Detroit, even after he did the one day deal to retire with them and then did play for two more teams afterwards. Uh, But he was like on their 75th anniversary all-star team in 2010. He was inducted in the Michigan sports hall of fame. And like, As a Canadian, he said he didn't have a lot of role models early on in the game, but he was a Canadian role model. That 250 was the record, as I said. That is until 2020, when in Dallas, of all places, their long snapper at the time, LP Ladakur, 
uh, did pass him finishing his career with 253 total games that he appeared in. But that's okay. You know, there's still more coming up. The CFL has grown. And even though that's not necessarily due to any play of Eddie Murray, it is still certainly influential for people growing up in Canada who might love football to see that there is someone who can go down south of the border, even if they've never played the sport once until after they've exited high school and just find some like beer league in between work and forklift shifts at Lumberyard. The two lane toe, Eddie Money. He will never eclipse Eddie Murray, who has the same birth year as him, doesn't even have the same sport and doesn't matter because he's so good at a completely different sport that he just wipes out this totally respectable career by Eddie Murray. And like Eddie Murray is in Cooperstown. Eddie Murray is not making it into Canton anytime. But I do think... Is there a Canadian Canton? That is a good question. Where is the CFL Hall of Fame? Or is it the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame? Canadian Sports would... Hall of Fame is in Calgary, Alberta. I don't know, actually, if Eddie Murray is in this. The pro sports is there. The, the Canadian Football Hall of Fame is at Tim Hortons Field in Hamilton. Oh, fuck. <laughs> anyway, I don't know where our hall is located. Maybe that's something we should figure out someday. I don't know what city has the best guy vibe. But wherever that city is, that is where I do want this Eddie Murray to find a place. Because despite not being the Eddie Murray, he is still the guy he's a eddie murray and eddie murray the eddies murray (laughs) have multiple careers worth talking about i think this eddie murray is the one today i think we have three good candidates this week i do love how billy bean is still relevant and very much contributing to the advancement of society with his role in sports he gets he gets major I want this person to succeed in life points for that. He also did play with the other Billy Bean and was regularly mistaken for him, which I don't know if anyone would mistake Eddie Murray for Eddie Murray. I mean, people used to ask Frank and Brooks Robinson whether or not they were related before they met them because people are stupid. Yeah. Um, I, I think we had three different angles to this and it's really which angle of the same name you want to do because you've got the two Billy Beans who have a lot of like intertwined nature for one. Like the first Billy Bean isn't even so big that second Billy Bean should be overshadowed. And yet they cross paths so many times and are so close to one another time-wise that it is there. So like that is, you know, running into your doppelganger frequently and playing with your doppelganger. (laughs) In Diaz's, we certainly have like, this is the single biggest name to live up to. There is no career you can have in that sport with the name Michael Jordan that is going to be separate from that. You simply can't do it. It's like the poor David Duke guy, only for much more positive reasons. With Eddie Murray, they start basically at the same time. You know, they both get kicked off in 1956. And football Eddie Murray has a great career. Is like a really solid kicker. And is a a bridge to kind of the, you know, he's going to have contemporaries who are lucky to hit 50% of their field goals. And then he's going to have contemporaries like Matt Stover at the end. Like he's is very interesting bridge in the realm of kicker. And also none of that matters because the other Eddie Murray was busy being one of the greatest hitters in the history of baseball. So that's like, that's the biggest career to be overshadowed. So we've got... A career that doesn't even have that big of a shadow, but it's so specifically intertwined with the shadow. One that is just absolutely engulfed by the shadow. And then one that is still hidden in the shadow despite its size. And how do you want to kind of approach those three? It's very interesting. It's a hard comparison to make. Well, so the, the one thing, like with mine and Xavier's, we have instances of them being confused for the other one. I don't think Eddie Murray was ever mistaken for Eddie Murray. Now, to to be fair, I do believe that was same name, lesser accomplishments, not necessarily like getting mixed up with people. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But you were correct. that That is an element that is not included. He does not have the most incredible mustache mutton chop combination that any baseball player has ever had the way Eddie Murray did. Eddie Murray, top five facial hair in baseball history all time. Yeah, like, I mean, him and Raleigh Fingers are on the Mount Rushmore. There's, that's sure. my top two, yep. That's got to be on the Mount Rushmore. Dave Steve had a really good, just, like, solid push broom stash. 
See, I would I would be pushing a lot harder for Mike if it wasn't for the fact that he was just very recently fired for allegedly not being a good yeah nice i person. didn't know the best way to tackle that because again there's so we we don't really know anything about it other than he got fired the one thing we can seemingly say it doesn't seem like crimes were committed it doesn't seem <laughs> like crimes were committed it was if anything just sports crimes not real crimes. Right. Sports but crimes. this is a sports podcast so our sports sure. crimes enough for us you could argue it was the impediment of other guys. Look, I love Mike Jordan, especially because, like, I mean, the reason why I wanted to bring him up is because when I was watching, like, Big Five basketball as a child growing up who was also watching Michael Jordan going for a three-peat, like, my dad just, like, let me believe it because I was like, hey, why is, why is Michael Jordan playing for Penn, too? He's like, oh, he's going back to school, son. Like, he's, like, messing with me. <laughs> going back to a different school. Yeah, yeah, he wanted to go to a better school, wanted to get his degree. Got his degree in sociology, by the way, Mike Jordan did. Which hope you would have hoped maybe a sociology degree would have taught you how to not get ingrated with people so much that they complain and get you fired from your job. You think that would have been something they would cover in a sociology class? For tricking you, we should induct Edwin Diaz. Honestly, I what I could have done, I've never been able to find it, but my dad always told me. He played two baseball games for DeVry in Atlanta, and they were like D3. <laughs> they needed somebody. Somebody in his hall was like, hey, Ed, you played baseball in high school, right? We need a second baseman. And he said he didn't get any hits, but he played a very clean second base, no errors. So I could have just talked about my dad, but I didn't. I should get points for that. <laughs> I will admit I am a little biased because I love that like Eddie Murray, again, is just working some blue collar fucking job playing in a rec league gets discovered out of nowhere by like one of a couple Canadian football coaches doing a position that he really only took because it was the closest thing to soccer he could do with it makes it to Tulane he plays in the sugar bowl in Tulane like already making it to that point they lose to Penn State so I didn't want to talk about it that much but and even then when he does that that's coming right after the season in which Eddie Murray already makes his first all-star team and finishes eighth in MVP voting. So like he's had this whole arc to get to the peak of his college career. He gets drafted into the NFL. And by that point, like around the same time as the draft when he debuts in 1980, Eddie Murray's like going to average 28 home runs for the next decade. Ooh, James, I might have to ding you. They played in the Liberty Bowl. The Liberty Bowl. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was like, I was thinking myself like, Tulane famously is or the last time they played the Sugar Bowl, they played Temple or something like that. So I was like, wait, did they play in the Sugar Bowl since then? I, I misread I a citation. <laughs> I mean, hey, if that's really what you're going to judge me on, fine. So be it. No, I'll judge you on losing to Penn State. Yeah, they do lose to Penn uh, State regardless of where they were. My, my, my petty grievances do make it very tough for me to vote in somebody who both part. lost to Penn State and made significant field goals for the Cowboys en route to a Super Bowl. Granted, I was not, like, I was alive, but not following the NFL at that point. But, like, this feels like repressed trauma was brought up. (laughs) Has he not received some amount of punishment for not only being cut then by the Philadelphia Eagles for Gary Anderson, but then later being cut a second time for Gary Anderson? Has he not suffered enough at the hands of the South African? No, that Gary is, that Anderson's is good enough to be cut for a couple times. It's fine. <laughs> that is so funny how Gary Anderson and Morton Anderson were both these international kickers changing the game in American football, but are from completely different countries and have nothing to do with each other. Different Anderson, too. O versus E. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's the, it's the Nordic versus the more British in we, origin. We have those two, and then we also have this fucking Canadian. And they're just like some of the best kickers in the world. Okay, so is kickers is the one thing where, yes, we import them from other places because the skills they learn playing other sports growing up happen to translate really well to kickers. So is it as much of a surprise that we have a a good Canadian kicker? I mean, here's my thing. I'm never going to shame any kicker for their position because we literally have one of the greatest kickers of all time. His name is Guy. Like, the kicker position, no matter where they come from, we must respect the kicker position. Oh, no, I respect the kickers. 
I'm just saying, like, um, it's not as surprising that, oh, a Canadian replaced by a South African replaced by a Dane. To, like, it seems more... Lion. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't surprise me because a lot of kickers come from soccer backgrounds. And where do they play soccer? Everywhere. Shout out Luis Sendejas. If we're talking about overall impact on the sport, I mean, yeah, then it's Billy Bean, no question. Like, if we're talking about what someone has done and accomplished outside of the sport, Billy Bean is the winner here. The best career that is overshadowed by someone with the same name is Eddie Murray's. For that reason, I am going to stick with Eddie Murray because that was my interpretation of it. That being said, I completely understand what we're saying, like, who did the most for the sport? Billy Bean did more. Yeah, and I think that I totally think that's fair with Eddie Murray's actual like playing career. But I also think about the fact that Billy Bean is overshadowed by someone who he was specifically better than at that sport and has had a very successful post playing career in that sport. But it's overshadowed by the same guy in that sport who was his teammate, who he was better than playing it because of what that teammate did as an executive. Like, if we're talking about post-playing careers, the other person with his name did also have a pretty good post-playing career. Well, yes, that's what what I'm saying. It's one of those things where if you just took their playing careers, our Billy Bean 100% had a better playing career than executive Billy Bean. And even with that, like, his post-playing career is better than his playing career. It's just that other Billy Bean, Brad Pitt, had a better, better post-playing career. So it's one of those things where it's so intertwined. And the thing that they did as a career, our Billy Bean was, some, was, was better than Brad Pitt Billy Bean, but still overshadowed in that exact same sport by Brad Pitt Billy Bean. Diaz, we sound pretty entrenched. I'm sorry to put you in this position, but it does sound as though it's coming to you. No, I, And again, if I, you choose gay icon Billy Bean, I'm all here for it. Look, I respect the position, but, you know, ultimately this hall does not base guy based on race, sex, creed, sexual orientation, religion. Uh, we base them on guy. That's, that's the only thing that we base them on. For me, what this one comes down to is when I thought of the prompt, at least, I was thinking mono sport perspective. I was kind of thinking from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, that is the ultimate factor for my vote. Okay. And while I have the utmost respect for Eddie Murray, the kicker, excepting for the two times that he played for the Cowboys and (laughs) those instances, he was a piece of shit. However, all respect to Eddie Murray. Eddie Murray may get in on relitigation, but there's only one guy that can get in this week. It's the guy who doesn't need an E on the end of his name. He just keeps it simple. He just does what needs to be done. He just supports other gay athletes trying to be more comfortable as we progress further as a society. He is our inductee this week with two E's because he doesn't need one on his last name. Billy Bean, welcome to the Hall of Guy. Inductee with three E's. He took the extra one and put it over there. That's what it, inductee. Mm -hmm. We are happy for Billy Bean. We are happy to have another LGBTQ plus icon here in the hall, joining some of the other luminaries that we have there. And we appreciate you all for joining us. Uh, Some things are in order. First off to Craig, our producer and all of the coders behind him. Second off to our musical director, Don Ham. Third off, I'm going to go ahead and call a shot here. I want to thank the Las Vegas Aces for putting on such an excellent show the day before this comes out in their <laughs> absolute destruction of the New York Liberty. Give me those horns if I failed. I don't care. Aces, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Anything you guys got to say on the way out? Oh, I mean, uh, check all our stuff at bit.ly slash remember that guy, all one word, all lowercase. You know the deal by now. Come on, share the show with people. No, I'm, I'm very excited for that game that will have been played. I am just going to be that Rob Lowe meme the whole time between the two of you. We're going to have aces on one side. you have an orange hoodie? Just wear a hat on the other. WNBA. I, I would assume they sell the hoodie at the team shop. I'm, that's I would hope I so. I would hope so. If you're going to go hoodie, I respect that. 
No, I'm going to go hoodie, and you're going to catch me with a big sign that just says, I hope both teams have fun. <laughs> Xavier, how was that loss yesterday? Are, are you recovering yet? <laughs> I mean, I'll be recovering from going to New York City, which I hate, and then going back home. Here's what it really is. I was very close to being fully Team Liberty because I do love Sabrina Ionescu. But what it ultimately came down to is my inner Philadelphian will simply not allow me to root for a New York <laughs> team. You tried, but it, it also, just can't happen. And it also won't let me bandwagon the most recent champion. So I can't be an Aces fan either. So, you were bandwagoning last year. I'm fine with that. It was nice to have you along for the ride. That's fair. I, I have bandwagon credentials, but until... Engelbert, that's her name, yes. right? Kathy, yes. Kathy Engelbert, yep. Until Kathy Engelbert writes her wrongs and delivers a WNBA franchise to the city of Philadelphia, I have no choice but to continue to support her product, but no specific team. That's all I can do. That's all you can do. And that's all we can do this week. I've been James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. And I'm Diaz. And as Freddie Mercury once sang, I want to ride my bicycle. <laughs> I can go second. I like going second. I, li- I like the sandwich. Okay, there we go. A delicious DS sandwich. You know something that always bugs me is anytime people say like sandwich when there are two siblings on either side of you it's a sibling so you don't call a sandwich by the bread like there's very few sandwiches that you describe by the bread it's the filling and it just always frustrates me when people say that it just bugs me like if you had like it kid rock between two slices of white bread it would be a white sandwich but not because of the bread <laughs>